We're, we're losing the ability to talk to each other about really difficult topics. Uh, as a country, we're losing the ability to do this. Deborah Tannen, a Georgetown linguist, noticed that we're involved in what she calls the argument culture today. So when we talk about differences, it spirals out of control very quickly. Instead of giving you an academic description of what the argument culture is like, I want you to actually see it. So watch as O'Reilly and Geraldo try to talk about immigration. And number two, true. when you're caught committing a crime, as this man was, he was drunk in public place. Oh, four and one time he was a drug drug with no victim. Been, he should have been deported the first time. And he was not. And the reason he wasn't deported is he didn't commit a felony. Doesn't make any difference. And he didn't he commit a, a misdemeanor. A he didn't commit a misdemeanor mm -hmm. uh, having to do with moral turpitude. All right, either. So let me just say, well, everyone followed the law. You all, everyone on apology from the governor no, to the mayor down. No, they didn't. Now, I just want to get this straight. You, Geraldo Rivera, with teenage daughters, right. are telling me that you are okay with a, and somebody sneaking into the country, becoming drunk, get convicted of a DUI, and staying here. My, all right my nightmare is my daughters having anything to do okay with a drunk. Let me finish my answer. My nightmare is my daughter's having anything to do with a person driving drunk. That's my nightmare. Okay. It could be a Jewish drunk. This it could be a Polish drunk. Here. It could be an Irish drunk. No. It could be an Italian drunk. American what the crime hell difference does it make? makes plenty of difference. It does not. He doesn't, doesn't have a right to be here. He doesn't have a right to be in this country. What? But that's not All right, let me stop it right there. Stop. Because then it gets really bad, okay? That's the argument culture, right? I don't listen to you, I, and if I do listen, I listen to attack. There's no a, attempt to find common ground. I talk over your answers, right? This isn't a dialogue, it's competing monologues. Three communication scholars asked the question, in today's environment today, what would happen if honest Abe, Abe Lincoln, actually ran for political office? What would the attack ads sound like against Abraham Lincoln? Has President Lincoln given up at a speech in Pennsylvania. He even refused to dedicate a battlefield still fresh with the blood of tens of thousands of Union soldiers. We cannot take it. We cannot concentrate. We cannot follow this ground. Lincoln believes that America will perish from the earth and from the earth. And that our soldiers have died in vain. Died in vain. Honestly, died in vain. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln, wrong on the war, wrong for the Union. I am George B. McClellan, and I approve this message. <laughs> <laughs> now here's what's happened. If that would happen to Honest Abe talking about differences, what would happen to us? So I think we've psyched ourselves out of difficult conversations. I think we don't have them because we're afraid we're gonna get launched into the argument culture. Now the problem with that is it creates latent conflict. Latent conflict is conflict that exists below the surface and it absolutely bleeds out into a relationship. Dr. Grace could talk about something called emotional contagion. My negative feelings towards you actually bleed into the relationship and poison the conversation even before you have the conversation. Now, I think there's hope for us, and the hope comes from the book of Proverbs. When I was studying the book of Proverbs, I came across a verse that I thought was very interesting. This is what the writer of the Proverbs says. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies live at peace with him. I love the realism of the verse, right? You're still going to have enemies, but is there a way that you can live at peace with people even within your disagreements? So tonight, if you take advantage of this coffee and conversation, you better walk in with a plan of how to have a difficult conversation. If you don't have a plan, it is sure to spiral out of control. Don't think that the mere fact that you're talking about the issue is a positive thing. Book of Proverbs says that life and death are in the power of the tongue. So if you don't have a structure for the conversation, it could really spiral out of control and do more damage to the relationship and to the communication climate. So let's have a structure to these conversations, and that's what the book I Beg to Differ is about. Uh, from the book of Proverbs, let's take a look at four questions that we ask in sequence, and we don't move from question one to question two until we get the answer to question number one. So from the book of Proverbs, what's question number one? He who gives an answer 
before he hears, it's folly and shame to that person. So the very first question we ask is, what does this person believe about this issue? Right now, I love what the, uh, what the writer of Proverbs says. He says, it is folly and shame. I think we get the folly part, right? Uh, I, I did debate in college. So sometimes when my wife is talking about an issue, I launch into a debate mode. I mean, she'll start to say something and I'll jump in with a reply and Noreen will say, that's not even what I'm talking about. And my response is, but if it was, <laughs> right? That's what I would have said. But it's interesting that the writer attaches shame to it, that it's demeaning to a person to uh, speak to them without listening. Uh, by the way, psychologists will tell you the number one way to love a person is to listen to that person. Now here's the problem if it's your roommate. Here's the problem if it's the person you're dating. Here's the problem if it's a family member. I could do your perspective. I've heard what you believe about this issue. I could actually do it word for word. I don't need to listen to you. So why start off with listening? Because John Gottman, one of the key marital researchers, says this. How you start that conversation is how you're going to end it. He calls it the critical startup. That first minute of that conversation determines the tenor of the entire conversation. So guess what? You start by giving your perspective and doing it aggressively. Guess what? You're going to get that in return. But if you start by listening to a person, right? No, tell me what you think, and I'm not going to jump in and co-opt the conversation, right? Now, if you were in Talbot Chapel yesterday, we need the power of the Holy Spirit to do this via the spiritual disciplines. So in some ways, if you jumped from Monday to Wednesday, you missed the most important part of the series, which is you need to practice the spiritual disciplines. Because if that person says something hurtful while you're listening, you're, you're going to want to react, and you're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit not to react. So I suggest that you listen to that part of uh, the series, or I'm not trying to hawk my book, but to, to skip to this place is incredibly dangerous because you won't have the power to overlook an insult if it comes during question number one. Um, hindrances to listening. We confuse listening to evaluate with listening to understand. I hope at this university we're teaching you to listen to evaluate, but you don't do that first. You listen to understand first. By the way, listening is not the same as condoning something. Just because you listen to Nietzsche, just because you, uh, you go to the same sex conversation we hosted with a side A, side B Christian, uh, regardless where you are on that issue, listening to one of them doesn't mean you're condoning it. You're just listening to understand. But if you listen to evaluate, then you're jumping in and interrupting that person. Um, 500 doctors were surveyed in the United States, and here was the question. How long does a patient have before you actually jump in and co-opt the conversation? You know what the average answer was? 18 seconds before a doctor comes in and actually starts to prescribe something. We have to be careful that we don't do this in question number one. Now here's the problem, we're becoming horrible listeners. We, we really are. We're, we're so moved by social media technology that we let it co-opt our listening ability and paying attention. For instance, in my house I have three boys, so um, ESPN is on all the time. Sports Center is on all the time. So my wife could be saying something, something really intimate. Like, I realized as a teenage girl I was abducted by aliens. Okay, right? She's saying something, and the theme music to Sports Center comes on. And I'm looking at my wife and I'm going, oh, don't, don't. And it doesn't even matter what it is. It could be Yiddish shuffleboarding. And I'm like, hang on, Noreen, I want to see if Jan gets the red one. Hang on for a second. <laughs> so listen, your technology, as great as it is, is destroying your ability to be mindful, which is to be fully present in the moment. Some of you are on laptop computers right now. You're not fully present. Right? I mean, that's just a reality that if you're texting, looking at your phones, you're losing the ability to be mindful. You just are. And what we need to do is reclaim the ability to do one thing well at a time. And I'm greatly concerned, and now the research is coming to say your technology is destroying your ability to pay attention. It's just destroying it. Because we've lost the social aspect, which it's just rude to do that. That's kind of gone by the wayside. What I'm telling you right now, and Dr. Grace would back this up in a heartbeat, is that we're losing the ability to focus. And, and that's going to hurt us as communicators. So what we have to learn is something called clear the mechanism. So this comes from a great movie called For the Love of the Game. Uh, Kevin Costner is a Detroit Tigers pitcher. Gotta love that, I'm from Detroit. He's a Hall of Fame pitcher, and he's going to retire at the end of this game, but he's told no one that he's going to retire. 
okay? So uh, he's pitching his first no-hitter in Yankee Stadium, and we just hate the Yankees, don't we? Okay, so <laughs> listen to what he has to do to focus on what he's doing. Play the video. Now, as you during step one, as you're asking the question, what do you believe? You better believe you're gonna have what we call communication noise. That person's gonna say something, and you're like, I totally disagree with how you just characterized my position. I don't use that kind of tone, and I don't appreciate the tone you're using right now. I can think of five ways that you're wrong right now. That's all communication noise. We have to clear the mechanism, which means I'm going to listen, not to debate, but to understand. And, and by the way, biblical solitude, biblical meditation is the ability to be alone, present with the Lord and not think about anything else. So question number one is incredibly important. It sets the tone for the entire conversation. Question number two, why does this person believe? Look at that proverb. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So again, what we do is we switch the proverb. We say, no, 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 let me tell you how your view leads to death. Right? But that's not how the proverb starts. No, there's a way that seems right to a person. So I first want to understand, why does this seem right to you? Your history, right? The Harvard Negotiation Project says the biggest mistake we make is we just trade conclusions. I never ask you how you arrived at the conclusion. Right? We have to get the backstory of your belief, your passions, your convictions all have a backstory. I love what the proverb says in Proverbs 20, verse 5. The purposes of a man's heart are deep waters. Right? My job as a conversationalist is to surface. Why are you so passionate about this? Right? And to get background information, influential people, books that they've read, movies they've seen, uh, events that have happened in this person's life. Uh, consider Steve Jobs for a second. Steve Jobs is compared to the modern Ben Franklin, right? He's an incredible innovator. But if you know anything about Steve Jobs, you know he was uh, impossible to work with. He was a perfectionist, right? So if you're working with Steve Jobs, he has all these passions and convictions. You could work on a project an entire year, and with one, he wouldn't even say a word when you presented it. He would just go, and a whole year's work was gone. So Jeff Goodall interviewed him for Rolling Stones magazine, and he made a very interesting observation. And here's his observation. The central trauma of his life, after all, was being given up for adoption by his parents. And now he's being kicked out of his second family, Apple, the company he founded. A close friend once speculated to me that Steve's drive came from a deep desire to prove that his parents were wrong to give him up. A desire, in short, to be loved. Or, more precisely, a desire to prove that he was somebody worth loving. Now, if you're now working with Steve Jobs and you have that information, is he still hard to work with? The answer is yes, but what does that foster? It may foster sympathy. It may foster empathy, right? By the way, don't conflate the two. Uh, empathy is my ability to project myself into your situation. Sympathy is that I actually have a tender heart towards you. In other words, I can learn you come from a broken family and imagine what that's like. That's empathy. Sympathy is I, I actually feel sorry for you or I feel compassionate for you. I can actually be empathetic and not sympathetic. So we need to try to have a sympathetic reading of a person's position. So question number one, what does this person believe? Question number two, why do you believe it? How did those beliefs, passions, convictions originate and have such force in your life? 
Okay, here's the one I think we blow the most as Christians. By the way, the argument culture teaches us to completely bypass this one, right? The Republicans and Democrats, they don't agree with each other. I was on Capitol Hill uh, four years ago um, speaking at the Faith and Law lecture series with interns, Democrat, Republican, and they said, boy, C Capitol Hill's a mess right now. There's no attempt to find common ground. So we have to do that, right? So question number three is, after listening to this person, where do you agree with this person? Proverbs 15, 14 says, the discerning heart seeks knowledge. So in, in my Calm Theory class, I have my students read the Quran. By the way, when they're done reading the Quran, they're part of the 1% of American Christians who have ever read a, a religious book of a different faith tradition. Now, some of my students are up for reading the Quran if we're going to dismantle it, if we're going to attack it. That's why the first thing we want to focus on is where do you actually agree with the Quran? Where does the Bible and the Quran actually agree with each other? Now, immediately that makes Christians uncomfortable because we're equating understanding with condoning. I had a mother call me and said, I did not send my daughter to Biola to read the Quran. This was pre-tenure, by the way. Can I just say that? And I said to her, why did you send your daughter to Biola? She said, I want her to be a follower of Christ. I said, boy, we, we resonate with that. And do you know that Christ said to take the gospel message into all parts of the world? And do you realize that one out of five people in the world are Muslim? That we have to understand the perspective when we get to it? We just don't do a good job with finding common ground. So here's something I do with my students in my comm class. Uh, Michael Hart is one brave individual. He did something crazy. He wrote a book called The 100, in which he not only sought to identify the top 100 people in human history, he, he ranked them. By the way, ladies, as you read this, you'll be shocked. You just don't make many of these lists. I don't know what you were doing in human history, but Michael Hart apparently doesn't think you were doing much. Interesting gender observation. So, because uh, he's a male writing the book. So here's what I do with my students. I present the top 10, but I do it out of order. Here's his top 10. Albert Einstein, Sue Lin, the creator of paper. Uh, Buddha, St. Paul, Christopher Columbus, Muhammad, Isaac Newton, Jesus Christ, Gutenberg, and Confucius. Now I give them part of the top 10 ranked in order. By the way, if we had time, it'd be fascinating for you to take out some paper and you rank them in the top 10 from 10 to 1. Well, here's a partial list. Coming in at number 10, Albert Einstein. Number 9, Christopher Columbus. Uh, eight, Gutenberg. Seven, Su Lin. That makes sense. Gutenberg would be useless without paper. Six, St. <laughs> Paul. Five, Confucius. Four, Buddha. Right? Now, what's his top three? Here's his top three. Coming in at third, Jesus Christ. Now, what's beautiful about doing this with Christian audiences, immediately they want to stop all conversation. What? God got bronze? <laughs> what? What? Right? Look at number two. Isaac, he got beat by Isaac Newton? Which, of course, we know what number one means, it's Muhammad. Well, it's great to hear my students talk about, it. okay, stop, 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 whoa, what are we missing right now? And I love it, eventually one student raises his or her hand and says, I don't know if I know his criteria. Awesome, what's his criteria? By the way, here's his quick criteria. Yeah, of course religion is important. Six of the top 10 are religious figures, but it's not just religion, it's science, or I'd be yelling at you in the dark right now if, if science were important. So my top two are always going to be somebody from religion and somebody from science, right? I'm not gonna put two religious people in a row and I'm not gonna put two science people in a row. Now, what about Jesus? The problem with Jesus is St. Paul is in the top 10 and he siphons votes away from Jesus. In other words, Jesus is the creator of Christianity, Paul is the CEO of Christianity, and Jesus, by his own admission, said, I'm just a religious leader. I'm not military, I'm not political. Muhammad was religious, political, and military. He was more diverse. And by the way, never was I gonna put two religious people back to back. It was always gonna be, one was gonna be religious, one science, and I'm giving the nod even to religion being number one, but science would always be number two. Dead silence in my class. Finally, one student said, uh, I don't know if I can say this, but I kind of, I don't have a problem with that. <gasps> you sell out, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> no, but listen, I, by the way, what's the one piece of information Michael Hart is missing from our perspective? Listen, Michael Hart, I just assume that if Jesus was God, he would uh, go up to number one. But, but that's where the disagreement comes in. If you start with Michael Hart with the disagreement, 
right? He's expecting that. You're from Biola. You're going to talk to him. Of course you're going to disagree. So the person you're going to have the conversation with tonight, don't start with where you disagree with that person. Start with where you agree with that person. Now, why is this incredibly important? Because it feeds into what we call the rule of reciprocation. My wife and I lived overseas. We were in Moscow for um, six weeks. Uh, a bunch of Americans were going to go play basketball. And what's interesting is we lived in a hostel for six weeks run by a woman who didn't like foreigners. I thought that was like a bad career choice, OK? Um, <laughs> If we were late to dinner, she would just like lock the door, right? Well, one day we go to play basketball, a couple of us, and, and there is an elderly Russian man trying to push a car. It's a Russian car, so think of an American smart car and cut it in half, okay? That's a Russian <laughs> car, okay? So we just walk up, literally lift the car, and it's, it, she's in the front. The woman who runs the hostel is in the front and jumps out. I thought she was going to yell at us but she's trying to say thank you to us. Do you know the next morning she met us with flowers? Do you know that we, couldn't, we could be late to dinner by an hour and a half and she'd get in her bathrobe, bathrobe and open the door? Why? The rule of reciprocation is generally this. I will treat you as you treat me. So if we start this conversation with me debating you, guess what, you get debate. If I start with sarcasm, guess what, you get sarcasm. If I start with listening, compassion, and common ground, generally the rule says you'll get that back. Make sense? That first minute of the conversation you're going to have tonight over coffee will be the most important minute. Be very careful how you use that first minute. Also be careful how you end it. So the last question is this. Based on all the knowledge you just gained from questions one, two, and three, right? How should I proceed? The book of Proverbs says, by wisdom a house is built. By understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches, right? What do we mean by um, knowledge? It, facts. Understanding is the priority of facts. Wisdom is what do I talk about after I've prioritized. I like to ask this question. With this person, right, this person, you may have a negative history with this person. Every time you try to talk, voice is raised. So guess what? Your goal may be tonight, conversation over coffee, is I'm not going to raise my voice. That's my one communication goal. I'm not going to raise my voice. At this time, man, time is incredibly important. After 24 years of marriage, my wife knows when not to talk to me. Heading up to bed, my wife knows not to. I'm just tired, right? Best time to talk to me is dinner. At, with a cup of coffee. I had that cup of coffee, and Noreen says to me, oh, honey, half the house burnt down. I'm like, it happens, <laughs> right? <laughs> so with this person, this person with your relational history, at this time, maybe lunch is wrapping up and you don't have enough time to launch into your perspective. Well, don't cram it all in. Uh, these circumstances, man, if it's during finals week and everybody's crazy, right, that might not be the best time to talk to your... Um, uh, roommate, under these circumstances, what is the one thing I want to say? Not the five, right? The one. Now, this comes into play like when we're talking to family members, right? Or we're talking to the person you're dating or your roommate, where in your mind, you're always, it bugs you what that roommate's doing, right? And you're just like, oh, I'll tell you what. But you, for some reason, you don't bring it up. But that doesn't mean you don't have latent conflict. It doesn't mean you don't have the conversation in your head. How many of you have done that? I'll tell you what, if I ever told you what I thought, I'd say this, 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 oh, for sure this, right? Oh, and I stopped at Kinko's, I got colored charts. I am ready to go with this. But for whatever reason, it doesn't happen. Then, out of the blue, your parents actually ask you what you think about the rules. Um, your roommate actually asks you, hey, what do you think about the cleanliness of the apartment? And you go, oh, this is it. <laughs> this is not a drill. Oh my, what was my acrostic? That's right, okay, yes. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. And the person's listening to you going, note to self, never bring this up again. So we don't want to do that. So I, I'm talking to this one person, I'm thinking, okay, pull back. We don't have a great relational history. If we do have a great relational history, I think I can go further quicker. But your goal always can't be defend my position and defeat the other person. That's the argument culture, right? Paul says to the church at Ephesus, I want you to, with passion, pursue unity. Because remember Monday's talk. The reason you're going to have that coffee tonight, even though you don't want to, the reason I sent 
that email before this series is because Christ was asking me to do it. Uh, there was nothing within me that wanted to do it. I did it because Jesus means that much to me. So for some of us, the first place to have a difficult conversation is not a communication textbook. It's sitting at the foot of the cross. And I absolutely believe what the Apostle Paul says when, he, when he's speaking to the church at Galatia. This is what he says. I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and was crucified for me. Men and women, the best thing you can do as a Christian communicator if you want to produce compassion, empathy, is to understand that 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died a horrible death for you. What does the book of Hebrews say? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What was the joy set before him? It was you. So when I embrace that type of forgiveness, that type of unconditional love, then Jesus says, now give that to the person you're speaking to. We're going to want to react against that. They don't deserve it. And the Holy Spirit is going to nudge you and say, but did you deserve it 2,000 years ago? So men and women, I want to pray for these conversations tonight. How many of you know you, you have a conversation already you need to have? Show of hands. Okay? Have it tonight. Start it. And just start it by listening to the perspective of the other person. You don't need to jump in. I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit, one, the people who raised your hand, that God gives you the strength to pursue that. And for the rest of us, just an openness that perhaps there's somebody we need to talk to that the Holy Spirit hasn't surfaced yet. So let me pray for you. Father, we come before you. We, we submit to you that we're forgiven. We submit to you that we're loved unconditionally. And that is so meaningful. I think of all the ways that I've blown it. And yet you love me. Uh, Father, I, I pray that we could take that grace, that compassion, that empathy, that sympathy, and bestow it to other brothers and sisters in the faith. I, I pray for each person who raised their hand. I pray that they'd have the courage to send a text, uh, an email, a phone conversation, to initiate a meeting tonight. And Father, we know that that greatly pleases you. We love you. We do this for Jesus' sake. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.